Hi, everybody. We're here this morning with a real special guest with Marisa Marquez, state rep-elect in the central part of El Paso in a terrific hard-fought election, and she is now going to Austin because in November she doesn't have an opponent. Marisa, welcome to the show. Thank you, Senator. Let's talk a little bit about that district. What are the boundaries of that district and, and what's in it? District 77 is in the heart of El Paso. It includes most, most of downtown, central El Paso, uh, Kern Place, Kern Area, Mission Hills. Uh, the border as far as the west side goes up to Executive Center, so it includes a university. Um, it goes far east as Hawkins and Viscount. So I have a, a, a small section of the east side, anything lower as, as District 76. It goes, includes the airport all the way up to Fred Wilson, Hondo Pass is, is the border there. Um, so it's a very exciting, very diverse, densely populated area uh, as far as di districts go here in El Paso. What high schools are there? You've got Austin, El Paso High, Burgess. Bowie. Bowie. Is Irvin in that district? No. Irvin's right outside, but a lot of the constituents in my particular district do attend Irvin. Well, you are now my state rep, so I'm real pleased to be talking to you on the show and moving some of the stuff forward. A Thank lot you. of the most exciting things in El Paso are going on in that district. I think we'll talk about them a little bit later in the show, but let's talk about you. Where did you grow up in El Paso? What was your educational experience? And share with us one story about your family. Uh, well, I'm a, my, both of my parents are from El Paso. We are set, my, on my father's side, seventh generations here in El Paso, in Isleta and San Eli. Um, I was born in Houston, Texas, because my dad was in dental school at the time. Um, so I was kind of a surprise. And then uh, we moved back to El Paso, and I've, you know, native El Paso, and been in all the schools here. I have a younger sister, Mirasol, she's a, a student at UTEP. Um, graduated from high school in 96, went off to the University of Notre Dame, studied finance and economics. Uh, was very involved in leadership roles uh, and campus ministry when I was at Notre Dame. Graduated in 2000 and joined AmeriCorps quickly after that. Came back to El Paso and worked in Acción Texas, which is a nonprofit that provides capital to micro businesses or businesses that can't access capital through traditional means. Um, after which, I returned to the University of Notre Dame and studied theology. Um, back here in El Paso, worked for the Tiguas in 2004 to 2006, and then decided to run in a campaign in 2007, and here I am. Tell us about Notre Dame. That's got to be an experience. World University, really. A yeah, absolutely. Like I was telling you earlier, we have the largest alumni association in the world. We have students from all over that come to the university. It is known as the, Cap the Catholic University of the Americas. Um, it, it was a great experience. Aside from the football, the football gets us all excited and, and, <laughs> and riled up against Michigan and Michigan State. But the, the campus atmosphere is, is very unique. Uh, to have the church right there on campus, to have such camaraderie uh, as Fighting Irish, it was wonderful. I had a great experience. I, I was in many leadership roles, like I mentioned. I was the president of La Alianza, which is the Latino organization on campus, which had a membership of 530 people. And during my tenure, in my junior year, we increased that by 300% just by making sure that people felt included there on campus. And I thought it was a very important uh, for the Latino community, especially under the Catholic Church, where we make up a majority of the Catholic Church, that they feel included at a university like that. So you had colleagues from Chile and Argentina, Mexico, all the way, everywhere across the world at Notre Dame in this organization that Absolutely. you headed? Absolutely. Wow. You know, it's probably a little before your time, but Notre Dame, back in the day, legendary football. Joe Montana, I got to tell you a little bit about a game, 1979, Cotton Bowl. I can remember that. I was watching that. It was like yesterday. I think it was snowing that day. Mm -hmm. And Montana, this is really the beginning of his kind of swashbuckling uh, quarterback style. And he goes on, of course, to work with uh, Bill Walsh and the California offense, West Coast, and all that stuff, and win mm -hmm. four Super Bowls. But if you talk about Notre Dame football, that era, of Joe Montana, people, they go crazy about that even today. Oh, definitely. He comes back, well, at least when I was there uh, in 96 to 2000, he came back a couple of times for pep rallies. And you're always a domer. Every time, every, any football player that's gone out and done very, very well in the NFL has always come back, and they know their roots at Notre Dame, and the tradition there is just beyond any other university. 
uh, also Regis Philman, Phil Donahue, a lot of, we have a lot of um, big names that come back and, and really support the team there at Notre Dame. Let's go back into some of your work experience because one of these issues I think is very important for El Paso mm -hmm. and it's access to capital, access to credit, the ability of small businesses to grow and, and function, uh, equity, capital, Acción has been one model, there are others. Mm -hmm. What did your experience in that field teach you about uh, the ability to access credit here in El Paso and along the border? Overall, uh, I think it's more difficult for startup startup businesses and you know particular businesses such as restaurants or service oriented um, businesses and and that's difficult because you have people that are putting you know that are willing to put in their life savings or their earnings to make this work and the, unfortunately they don't have access to smaller loans banks are interested in loans that are over fifty thousand over sixty thousand in order to, to work on expansion or or some kind of startup that's that's expanding into the area uh, and, and it's unfortunate because you have these businesses that could target a particular group in El Paso that has their client base already developed and they just can't, they can't get the funding to either get materials, to expand into different areas, um, to expand their existing product, um, to afford, I mean we have, uh, this is great, I, what I did learn at Acción is that a lot of the, the micro businesses here, they go to Juarez and buy their materials and they bring them here and then they develop their product. I think that's great, and I think we need to you know, continue to support those types of initiatives, support those types of organizations that allow those micro businesses to grow. You know, when you get in the profile of El Paso employment, there are very few large employers, maybe a handful, six, seven, and there are 18,000 small businesses in El Paso that, that employ the vast majority of El Pasoans today. And especially today, where you've got a credit crunch, you've got markets kind of closing down in response mm -hmm. to uh, the mortgage subprime meltdown. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to need to do a little work on that. In, um, in the fall, we're going to have a big uh, conference here called Invest in the Dream. That'll be an international conference to kind of lay out what I call working principles of how we can get there. But financial literacy, for example, the ability to bank more people into uh, mainstream banking instead of having it in uh, cash, cash uh, the idea of actually saving money and moving forward, uh, all these financial skills that are so important to succeed in today's America how to work a credit card, how to make a bank account work, playing the stock market, making sure you don't get into a, a risky mortgage when you buy your home, all those mm -hmm. things I think are, are issues that we're going to need to work on a little bit more as we move forward to make the community Absolutely. really become entrepreneurial and I think that's where the action is in the future. Absolutely. Any success to any business is 80% technical assistance. They need to know how to keep their books, they need to know how to market, they need to know how to take care of their credit and their vendors, those types of things and I think that's very important to the success of micro businesses here in El Paso and like you said they're a large employer here. Uh, you know, there's very few big businesses here in El Paso, and so we have a lot of small businesses that need to grow and that have wonderful products and that could even expand regional, not just here in our city. You know, I see a bunch of these entrepreneurs that are just about to bust loose. Mm -hmm. They've got maybe a million in sales, and you, you can see them going to 10 million with just a little bit of working capital and other things, particularly in cross-border. Sometimes it's manufacturing, sometimes they're supplying. It might be services. So many of the people here that have such expertise, say, in in uh, educational services that mm -hmm. do work in San Antonio, that do work in the Valley, that do work in Denver, because what we've learned here educationally, people are turning into companies and businesses. And I think this is really an exciting part of what, what, we, what we have to work on the community. And it's centered right in the middle of your district. Absolutely, we want them to stay. We want them to stay and we want to create incentives and initiatives that recruits businesses to, to this area that creates jobs and we want our existing businesses to stay. We don't want them to leave somewhere else where it might be um, more, resources might be more available. We want, we want El Paso to be able to work with our business owners. Let's go back, tell us, share one story about your family, something people would say, that's the greatest thing I ever heard. Tell me something. Well, I guess I was, I was more prepared for that question. Um, I guess, I, my my father, the best way to make a man a feminist is to give him daughters, <laughs> and he's always said that. Yeah, he was always so worried. Uh, you know, uh, I wish I would have had sons or camping and and that kind of thing. And then uh, my sister and I came along, and my dad just really has put himself 100% behind us. And he's always told us, well, you can don't ever let anyone tell you you cannot do it because you got your dad, and that's all you need. You got your family. You got God, and I, I think it's I think it's great to have such a, a strong role model. That's a father. Not many people do, 
and it's unfortunate in today's day and age. I mean, you have children, Senator, and you're a great example to them, and you were speaking about how you were involved in your daughter's um, sports, and that's so important nowadays, and that's something that not a lot of our children here in El Paso have is that, that present parent. And, you know, my dad is just so behind women and just really giving it 100%. And I think it's great. And, and that's a lot of things, that, that's what a lot of people don't know about me, is that my father is probably, he raised me and my sister, mm -hmm. and he was a single parent, and he did an awesome job. And I, and I, can't, I can't thank him enough. I hope he's watching. That's a, yeah. That is a fantastic story. You know, when, when you look at women and successful women in the world, that father figure, that kind of strength, I'm not diminishing the role, obviously, of the mother. That's mm -hmm. essential. But having a, a father present in the day-to-day -day life of a young woman is such an important thing. My daughter, I, I can't tell you what a wonderful thing it's been to, to be a parent and watch her grow up and how strong she's become and what a good student she is and all the sports stuff and the lessons of sports about you got to persevere and, you know, it's you now that has to make this happen. And all those lessons that I think she's learned through the years, it's just wonderful to see that. And... I think that's a great, great thing that you just shared with everybody because it's important. And it's important that we, in state policies, think about how we foster that and how do we mm -hmm. make it more possible to do and make it not harder to do but easier to do and child care and some of the things that Absolutely. are so important in the lives of, of young families. Let's, uh, let's talk about this district of yours because sure. it is fantastic. I mean, bounded by Fort Bliss on one side, you go down, you've got the Medical Center of the Americas yes. on the other side, you've got Bowie High School the whole issues of the border and all the things that we talked about just before the show about how mm -hmm. important it is to expand our relationships with Mexico and create business and opportunities there. You got downtown about to emerge in maybe the best era in 50 years mm -hmm. and revitalization and so forth. Then over to UTEP and that wonderful university and really the anchor of what we have to do here educationally and economically is always at a university. So your district has all of these things in it. What are your priorities? What do you want to do as state rep for this district? Well, the priorities, of course, and, and something that I learned on the campaign trail and doing the research in my particular district and that what was most alarming was the 60% that don't have a high school diploma. And you and I know that we've, you know, we've had the privilege of going to a university and we've had the privilege of going uh, out into the business world with that degree and how many doors it opens. And I cannot imagine somebody without a high school diploma and what, how that limits them uh, in how they can provide for their family. Uh, it limits them as far as their goals um, you know, p professionally. And I think it's very important that we, s we begin to look at that very, very critically. I, I want to understand why it is that we have such an alarming rate of dropouts and people that haven't had the opportunity to go back and receive their high school diploma. One of the things I'm, I'm going to invite you to, have, to participate in, because I think it's really exciting, is the Bowie Project. And what we're doing is we're working with the new principal uh, at Bowie and the alumni of Bowie are maybe the strongest mm -hmm. alumni association in the country. You can't go anywhere where you don't run into osos orgullosos. If mm -hmm. you go to LA, there's 5,000 Bowie graduates that meet three or four times a year. But the idea, imagine a pipeline and a student's born, a young child is born in, in, in the Bowie district. Mm -hmm. We're trying to find out exactly what happens at every stage of the pipeline. So. As it turns out, one of the chief obstacles, one of the challenges that we have is early education. Mm -hmm. When a child gets through and has what's called academic vocabulary and they look at the world and their counterpart in Dallas is maybe operating with 60, 70,000 words or concepts that they now understand in the first grade mm -hmm. and a counterpart in, 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 in the buoy feeder patterns maybe at four or 5,000 in English and they're supposed to compete in high school and take the same test, you see what the challenge is. Absolutely. And so how do we create the opportunities? How do we create the extra teaching time? What are the most effective methods? There's a lot of people working on it. I think the lessons that we take from the Bowie Project, from mm -hmm. looking at that, we can apply in a lot of the feeder patterns in different high schools around the country. Mm -hmm. And so it's really exciting. We've got national experts coming here to help us. Uh, we're looking at how do we fund some of these things. But I think a lot of what the, the issue becomes is what did we do in early education how do we lay the, the groundwork for acquisition of language? Mm -hmm. What about reading, effective reading? Because every study shows if you didn't pick up that reading, and then you go into sixth grade and the beginning of math, and then everyone says, well, here's ninth grade algebra. Everyone, if we don't pass algebra, it's all over. But it starts much earlier. And Absolutely. I think that's what we're going we're gonna to find out, the, the, the real mechanics of what's happening by each grade. Something that I've seen in my experience and, and what I remember uh, in high school is we pretty much know who's going to college uh, and who's not by the time we're in ninth grade. 
And those study habits have already been developed in the early years, um, you know, the, the motivation coming from th and the support coming from the teachers, from outside uh, academic or extracurricular activities, their parents. We know, we know who's in ninth grade, who's who's on their way to college, and we need to get more students prepared by ninth grade. Put channeling money into high school is 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 high risk. We're going to lose a lot of them because it, things should have done been done earlier at the elementary at the very beginning to to condition these students in their study habits and to make them college prepared. I think you're exactly right and I, it's going to be very interesting to get really dig into this because we've been working on this now for about two years and we're getting different folks to help sponsor it and the best people in the country to come help us. Okay, let's really understand what's going on here. Mm -hmm. But when you get into language and reading acquisition, boy, that that right there is the beginning because if you don't, if you're not at grade level, then mm -hmm. you're beginning to fall behind and all of a sudden there's the familiar cycle of you're not reading at the third grade level and so you're going to kind of hold a student back and at the end of the day that's the student that doesn't make it to the ninth grade. Absolutely. Let's talk about your other priorities in your district. That was a great one by the way. Um, Health care of course um, we're seeing right now at least I'm seeing in my particular neighborhood we're seeing increasing uh, sales of houses. This is a buyer's market right now. Why? We have a lot of seniors that are losing their their homes because property taxes keep going up and they have to make the decision between buying their medication and you know paying their property taxes, groceries, other necessities and I think that that's extremely important how, how they're accessing to, how they're being able to ex access health care here on the, in the border and and the education process we have a lot of people that are going to the ER for a cold there needs to be an extensive education process in urgent care clinics and and seeing the primary care physician I, I think all of those parts would play an ex enormous role in in ex in allowing our seniors and our children to access health care my father's a dentist he's one of the few dentists that continues to take chip and Medicaid why? Because a lot of the dentists see a packet this big coming across their desk to take the chip and Medicaid, and they say, "Forget it. It's just too much work. They have to. There's too much red tape. It's, it's such a tedious process. And all they want to do is help the community. They want to see these kids that need access to health care. And unfortunately, it's, it's as a small business, like we spoke of earlier, they don't have the resources to put so much money and time behind such a process. You know, we just last session passed the FRU settlement uh, the concept. There's $700 million is now in the budget. A lot of that going to uh, dental work. This is the first time ever that Texas mm -hmm. has really taken a strong position on this. And we had a strategic planning session about a month ago to talk about how we get out in the community and make it easier, exactly the problems that you're talking about, because dental care turns out to be the gateway to a lot of other issues, particularly Absolutely. heart disease that a lot of people don't know about. So if you're 25, 30 and you really haven't had dental hygiene, it's just 40 and 50 where you get into heart disease it becomes mm -hmm. a real problem. So I think you're right on a really important issue, particularly in, in, in the area that you represent. Let's talk a little bit about the Medical Center of the Americas, one of my favorite topics. Mm -hmm. We, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago when we started moving on this stuff, mm -hmm. we were told it can't happen. You'll never mm -hmm. have a medical school in El Paso. And I found over my time as Senator, the biggest challenge really is us. It's eliminating the, the non-believers, those that say it's not possible, or those that say you can't do it, or those that say, no se puede, mm -hmm. don't even think about it, don't dream that big. And as a community, having the community dream that of course we can do it, and we're gonna go do it, and mm -hmm. getting out there and getting the, the community behind, getting it done, and then getting leadership to come and start laying the pathway. Part of it's the dream, and then part of it's the hard work and reality of making mm -hmm. it happen. But first medical school in the country in 30 years you're right in the heart of that. That's right next to your district, part of your district's in it. Tell us what you, uh, what aspirations you have for the Medical Center of the Americas. I think it's absolutely wonderful start and it, and it sends a loud, clear message to a lot of people in Texas and, and elsewhere that El Paso is now moving in the right direction and that they are welcoming change and that they're ready to move forward and take care of their citizens. I think both yourself and, and Norma Chavez did an excellent job in bringing those funds and, and really putting the community first and fighting the good fight. I know it wasn't very easy. I know it had taken a few sessions and I just really commend leaders like yourself and also Norma, uh, Representative Chavez, that did so much 
to bring that change and now it's going to be up to new leaders such as myself as the new leaders that we see in city council county commissioners court um, to to really take that dream and, and keep moving with it I almost see you all as kind of grabbing the resources I mean outside of my position now but I see the delegation in Austin as grabbing those resources bringing it to this community and kind of leaving it in our hands as a future to, to move forward and to be excited about those opportunities and to and you know to engage our communities in that well, when you go over there and you see all of what's happening, you know, the first students will come in 2009. Uh, we're trying to create the, the, the environment where half will be on full mm -hmm. scholarships. That's a big deal. That's great. Uh, we've got three centers of excellence that we're working in, so we get a brand as being the best place in the world to do Hispanic health care, health research, health uh, education, and then try and grow the expertise. In my view, You've got to grab a niche. You've got to be the best in the world at doing it because that's what matters mm -hmm. in the future. We're in a knowledge-based world. If you really want to compete, you're going to have to say, what do you do best? This is what we do best. Mm -hmm. One of the things that um, I think most of our colleagues in the legislature don't know, even today, is that we're already a majority-minority state. Mm -hmm. I bet 10 members of the House know that. Absolutely. And if you go and look into the United States and you look out in the future, in 2040, 2045, the United States will be majority Hispano. Mexicano, mm -hmm. Latino. And so when you say we're going to be the capital of Hispanic health, you're really saying something important. Mm -hmm. And I think people are beginning to say, what are the implications for diabetes research and where can we do it in the world? And what I've found is that recruiting these mm -hmm. really top-notch guys, Absolutely. If, you, if you went out and said, we're going to recruit the number two guy at Harvard Del Paso, people would say 10 years ago, not possible. Mm -hmm. the guy's not going to come there. Guess what? They're coming. Because when they sit there and they look, I'm blocked at Harvard, I'm the number two guy, I can never be the number one guy. Mm -hmm. But the better thing is I'm at a brand new medical school, mm -hmm. there's fifty million dollars in the bank already to, for an endowment, you got another fifty million dollars being raised in the community, and you're in an environment where you could be the best diabetes researcher in the world in five years. For them it's the opportunity of a lifetime and that to me is the hardest lesson that we've had to learn is believing in ourselves. Absolutely, and that's something that resonated throughout my campaign, and I think it, it was it was an excellent opportunity. And something that I did mention at my community reception was uh, this campaign meant not so much just for me w winning as as uh, a young educated El Pasoan and coming back to their community, but it really sent a message out to a lot of people that may have left El Paso and said, there's nothing here for me. And this is something that I heard on the campaign trail very much. And, and then when I'd knock at their door and I'd say, hi, I'm Marisa Marquez, I'm running for state representative, they'd say, oh, you're the same age as my daughter. But, and I said, well, is your daughter here? Does she vote? No, she left to LA, she left to, they left to Chicago, they left to Dallas, there's nothing here for them. Um, they weren't able to get um, a job after they graduated. And the, you know, El Paso's so close minded And I said, well, here's an opportunity, look at me. I'm here, I'm taking on an establishment, I'm saying that El Paso is ready for change and this should be a loud you know, signal to all of those people that left El Paso that, hey, y'all need to come back, you need to be part of this Medical School of the Americas, you need to be part of uh, the changes at UTEP and at the county, at the Children's Hospital and the Women's Hospital. And I think it's very important and, I, and I'm very grateful that the community said, yeah, we're going to stand behind you and we're going to make this change and we're going to embrace it, we're going to accept it and we're going to continue to nurture and foster that. But on our side, that is those who have embraced this leadership position, mm -hmm. we have to work to create the opportunity where someone like yourself or my daughter, mm -hmm. who just got into medical school, would say, I am going to fulfill all of my potential and I can do it in El Paso, Texas. Absolutely. When I talk to my daughter about, fingers crossed, maybe we can get her back here, about being the head of a di you know, pediatric diabetes unit at the medical school mm -hmm. and having a clinical practice, actually, it's exciting because in another community, you're blocked, you can't get to that point sure. early. And she's got a friend that's up at Brown, Tony Ramirez, who's from Socorro, who's mm -hmm. also on this path to be a doctor. So to me, on the one side, we want them to come back, but on the other side, we absolutely have to make sure that their potential is, is reached here in a job that is really satisfying, one that can, when they look back and said, I did something with my life and I did it in El Paso, Texas. And I can't think of anything greater. I mean, for your daughter, here comes Dr. Shapley coming back, but she's from this community. She grew up here, she knows the needs, she's familiar with the people. I think that that would be an excellent, and why wouldn't El Paso embrace her and say, come back and this is great and you know us, you're one of us, and now you're here to advocate for us. I think that's an awesome opportunity. Let's talk, let's switch now to another part of your district. Sure. You have all the fun in your district, mm -hmm. and that's downtown. We've mm -hmm. had a downtown that 
Uh, frankly, I started when I came back here in law mm -hmm. and worked downtown. And back in the early 80s, you had a pretty vibrant downtown. And then you saw a lot of stuff happen. 30,000 garment mm -hmm. jobs went to China. Mm -hmm. One of the buildings downtown was built for 18 million, revalued at 3 million. That's wow. how the, the, the property prices, the real estate Depression. values downtown have mm -hmm. been compressed because there's no activity down there. And so what is your vision? What do you see happening in downtown? What would be the state's role? What would, what would, what would be something that you'd see working on? Definitely um, tax incentives. Um, tax incentives to bring more businesses downtown. I think when I was working with the Tiguas, we explored opportunities to maybe even move something of the Tiguas down, downtown to capitalize on our resources that we have here in El Paso and make them um, a focal point in downtown. I think it's extremely important. What Paul Foster's doing, I think, is excellent. It's. It, I know that um, there has been a lot of debate over the downtown revitalization and the way the plan has been structured, and it hasn't. Regardless, uh, we do need a plan for downtown. It may not be the one that's presented here. It may need to change a little, but we do need something that's going to make El Paso a focal point. Again, here we have the School of the Americas, the Medical School of the Americas, and we have a downtown that's that's dead at five o'clock. I mean, it's it's not something that if we are recruiting these Harvard and Brown University um, top-notch professionals, we need to give them uh, an, an, an area and um, a quality of life that's worth coming down here for, and we want them to be a part of that. And I think it's a downtown's going to be extremely important in this next, maybe not this next session, but definitely down the line uh, as far as the state is concerned. Well, I think we'll, be, we'll see activity this session Good. On, on downtown, and I'm hopeful that we can move big pieces of the historic tax credits that you're talking about, some of the other things that I think are important. But let's do one last thing before we wrap sure. up here, and let's talk about the campaign and share with us one of the most uh, exciting parts of that or what 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 uh, memories do you have of one little piece of that campaign that you'd like to share I guess um, there were so many this, this it, it was just an interesting campaign trail and I know uh, you all watch closely um, as other elected officials and just really I just think it set such an example uh, for so many people that didn't think um, you know they ever had an opportunity or maybe the politics is not for me but just the passion that I saw in the people this election season that I haven't seen in El Paso in a long time I mean we had saw so many Obama and Hillary signs all over this district that we had never seen before people were not that involved people were not that um, passionate about a particular candidate and it was so exciting to see and when I would walk up to people's doors okay what is it that you're gonna do they were prepared they were prepared. It wasn't, oh, you're very nice, that's great, okay, and they'd shut the door. It wasn't that. They were opening their homes. They were saying, please come in. Please understand that these are some of the issues that we're dealing with. And who are you for, Hillary Obama? <laughs> and I said, I'm from Marisa right now. I'm worried about Marisa Marquez in District 77. But they would just be so passionate about the issues, and I thought it was excellent. And like I, I shared with you before, you know, a lot of them, you're my daughter's age, but she, she's not here. You're my son's age, but they're not here because they're just, El Paso's the same, it's gonna stay the same. They have the same people in power over and over and over. Hey, I said, well, this is your opportunity to send that message to your daughter and say, hey, there's change. There's a young lady running, came out of nowhere, came out of the community, and just really has moved forward and done the best that she can to, to, you know, to, do, to put her community first. Well, we are here with the next state rep in November She'll be elected. She's already the elected representative. And in January, we're going down to Austin, roll up our sleeve and get to work. It's exciting to have her here. She's full of energy. She's just come off the campaign trail. Marisa Marquez, please let her know your ideas. On May 13th, we're gonna have at the community college, and Marisa will be participating, mm -hmm. a hearing on base realignment and closing and its impact on state programs like schools, like UTEP, like childcare, and like healthcare, so I'm inviting everybody, mark your calendar, 9 a.m. Northeast Campus of the Community College, come on out and hear about BRAC and participate with your new state rep, Marisa Marcus. Until then, we'll see you, and every day's a great day in El Paso, Texas, as long as you're right here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.